Now to further discuss the role women play in Afghanistan's economy, let's bring in Nadia Hashimi. She's a best-selling author. Her most recent book is Sparks and Stars, and Nadia is a women's rights activist. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So first of all, give us an idea. What is life like for the average young Afghan woman under these current conditions? Well, you've just seen a little bit of a snapshot with these uh, young women who are expressing what their lives are like and what um, what risks they're facing in pushing for their own educations and for looking for ways to contribute to their local economies. But, you know, what's really important to recognize is that as, as challenging as the current life of a young Afghan girl or an Afghan woman might be, it is dramatically better than it was in the late 90s or under the Taliban regime. Every life, of course, is a product of the context of geography, of specific families, uh, but also of the policy of the existing regime. And in the past decade alone, dramatic gains have been made in the lives of all Afghans and more specifically in the lives of Afghan women in terms of life expectancy. Infant mortality rates are down. Maternal mortality rates are down by nearly half. And girls are now accounting for about 40 percent of students in the country compared to zero. So, then so those kinds of Im improvements have to be taken into consideration when we look at where the, where the trajectory is. So then how key would you say women are to the Afghan economy? Talk about their role. They are a growing and dynamic contributor uh, to the growing Afghan economy. And the Afghan economy in general, the GDP, has increased dramatically in the past 20 years. And so you see women getting really creative with how they're intersecting with economy, with businesses. There is now an Afghan uh, Chamber of Commerce for women, and they've put out recently a specific agenda that looks to advance women entrepreneurs in Afghanistan. You have a Ministry of Women Affairs as well to help support some of the, the challenges that they might be facing. Women are running 2,500 registered small businesses in the country. You have uh, almost a dozen women who are involved in exporting saffron and dried fruits and nuts. And beyond what's traditional, they're engaged in non-traditional industries as well, which is restaurants, food processing, construction, and media, to name a few. And then there are so many informal businesses. As you know, what people are running out of their households sometimes contributes dramatically to them being able to feed their families, which is really part of the local economy. So then also talk about the educational and vocational options that are now available. And, and what have leaders done to make these opportunities more available, not just to obviously to, to people who are in the cities, but also to girls in remote areas? There's going to be an incremental increase in what's available and what is accessible. And part of that really comes from the government's consistent push to try to increase infrastructure. And, and you know, for that, I would leave it to see what the government is actually able to do. And I would let, you know, someone from the government speak to their specific intentions. But slowly and incrementally, we have seen improvements in infrastructure, in digital access to, to more remote areas of the country, because there really hasn't been very much. Um, it's slow going. But again, this is where the humanitarian aid from international donors and humanitarian and international attention has to stay on so that we can continue to push for gains to be made across the country. So then what do you see as the biggest barriers to success or the threats to these strides that have already been made? A lot of it is logistical. Um, you know, I think that when we look at Afghanistan, we see that most of the challenges that women are facing are, are layered, really. We talk about poverty on top of COVID, on top of natural disasters, on top of drought. And so there isn't one single one, but, it, you know, the access to clean water, the consistency of electricity, the access to a local hospital, the access to a healthcare provider. So all of these really come from a basis of poverty um, that really, you know, needs a lot of economic support in order to be overcome. So as you mentioned economic support, what could we be looking at in terms of the amount or the type of support or protection that's really needed to help build on the gains that Afghan women have made? You know, what's concerning is that in the past year or so, we've seen about a 25 percent decrease in some areas in terms of pledges that have been made by international donors. And Afghanistan, as you know, relies so heavily on international support in order to continue to build and, and, and to continue to build on these gains that have been made in the past 20 years. So what we're looking for is, you know, how can we make some smart decisions going forward? Because after the U.S. withdraws its troops and in the wake of the announcement of the troop withdrawal, a lot of the aid looks like it might be shrinking. And that might be aid looking to shrink away as security 
concerns rise in the country. So what we need to look at is what are the best practices? Where have we made the most gains? What organizations, what strategies, what initiatives have made the biggest difference and focus our continued energies there? And so how do you see some of the political situations impacting women in search of better lives versus perhaps staying in the country or choosing to perhaps go abroad? Those are tough decisions that I think every individual is making. They're looking at the world around them. They're making assessments. They're judging their risk. You know, I speak with a lot of women who are in Afghanistan who are talking about being part of the future of the country, who are talking about not giving up, who are talking about insisting on a better future for their daughters and for their sons. And I admire their grit, their resilience, and that persistence and that uh, bravery in the face of, of real danger, because these are the women who are out there and putting their, their faces on the, on the struggle. Uh, but I also wonder, you know, are we expecting too much for all Afghan women to be interminably brave, interminably enduring all of this? Uh, and I hope that we will only expect of them what we would expect of ourselves. So I, I do believe that when families are making assessments about their own risk and what kind of future do they want to provide for their daughters, there may be a lot of Afghans who are looking abroad, who are looking to they might have to leave their home and seek safe harbor somewhere else. Well, thank you. We do appreciate your insights. Nadia Hashimi there, women's rights activist and the author of Sparks and Stars. Thank you so much.